I did. I did it first thing. <laughs> I did permissions That's how the video is going to start. That's great. <laughs> I did it first thing. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you have permission to record. Thanks to me. Well, good afternoon, man. How are you doing? <laughs> great. I'm good, great. Good. Let's see. Let, let's date our, our video because... Okay. I, I know that everybody thinks I'm crazy. It's 8 24 2020. It is not the end of the coronavirus pandemic. <laughs> nope. Nope. I've got to laugh about it. It's the only way to get through it. <laughs> oh, it, it's almost the end of the 2020 election season. It's, it's about to hit the hot time. We've got the peak here, and then it's over. Man, it's, that, that's crazy to think about, isn't it? Yeah. I'm, I, I, I've. I'm abstaining from politics in my life. <laughs> I, 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 I hit peak of it earlier this year, and I just, I, I'm coming down. <laughs> well, I, I figured I'd annoy you with a little po- political comment just because we're going to talk about a political subject today. So oh, no. the first the first political subject is um, we shot a video, and uh, Mac computers have terrible Wi-Fi cards, and the video glitched all over the place and was completely unusable. <laughs> Hooray. So Apple, if y'all want to fix your Wi-Fi cards, um, everything else is great though. I mean, I mean, keep doing everything else with the computers. And no complaints on. <laughs> <laughs> I have no opinion. But, I am not a Mac person. So we we had a discussion, and so I guess we'll have some different areas. Um, I don't think it'll change the discussion a whole lot, but we want to talk about the importance or lack of importance of learning music theory. Um, the the hot take is that music theory kills. Your musicality, and so we're we're just trying to discover: does music theory kill musicality or destroy creativity in any way whatsoever? No. <laughs> I'm gonna peek, peek the video. <laughs> End of discussion. Over. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next video. No, I think. <laughs> I mean, so I'm, the drummer needs to know where the G sus nine chords are. Yes, he needs to know. He needs to know all of his. <laughs> he needs to be. Able I to don't even it. know if I know where the G sus nine. What is that even a chord? Yeah, that, that would be a chord. That's totally. <laughs> that's an A and a C and a G chord. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I do know that. <laughs> and you're not even a drummer. And I'm not even a drummer. <laughs> um. I, I will state some of the best drummers I've played with, their theory is really good. Really good. And the better their theory is, the better they are as drummers. I, I, don't, I don't know why. <laughs> there was, um, uh, that was one of the things that Tom, Tommy Igo, um, who was like, a, who's, he's a really famous drum teacher at this point, and he had a whole lot of like Groove Essentials books over the past couple decades. But um, well, it was either him or, or it was either it was either Tommy Igo or Dave Weckl who are both like you know Dave Weckl's obviously a legend and Tommy Igo is incredibly good and as a teacher he's a legend in my opinion um, of drumming and, he's and a studio remember, guy isn't he I, I, I'm not, I don't I'm, know his history but I just I just knew him as a teacher like or through his videos but I remember it was either one of them or both of them have said at some point if you want to get better at drumming start learning the piano (laughs) (laughs) that's just one one, you know because you need to be able to contextualize what the the lingo that you know uh, more pitch centric musicians are talking just so that you can you can hang just so you can communicate verbally when you need to because you don't it's it's amazing how important it is just to be able to communicate um, and that gets us into the idea of why do we have music theory at all? And it's literally just communication. It, it's, it's a way for us to talk to each other. Um, and then secondly, it's a way for us to analyze something someone else has done and understand it. Um, so I don't think that uh, people started out writing music with theory. I mean, I think, well, okay. Uh, if you, you know. listen to Bach, maybe he did. I mean, some of that stuff sounds pretty theoretical. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we we I think we we mentioned this before, but and without getting into what is theory, you know, without getting into, because <laughs> um, it could you could I mean I'm you know it's too easy to to put that hat on, but um, but to just summarize what that could be very quickly, it's um it's just however whatever you choose verbally to communicate the, the sound you're making, 
So, you know, like we have an acceptable, we have an accepted, you know, way of teaching theory, you know, uh, that we're used to speaking lingo because we're um, Western college educated musicians who, you know, have also, yes. you know, we've, we've absorbed a lot of the same type of theory textbooks, but, yeah. you know. Do you know which ones you used? Um, there was this book that my, my very first uh, guitar, I'm calling him a mentor because not only did he like, you know, show me like a simple scale or two, but he also was like, listen to all these great artists. Um, he printed off a 500 page book. I was like, I was like 15 or 16, maybe. He printed off this 500 page, page book called How Music Really Works. I can't even remember whose publication it was, but he handed it to me and he said, read this. And I went home that summer and I stared at a circle of fifths. I had no idea what I was looking at. <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, I wonder, like, I wonder which... Uh, classification that comes from because there's basically what is there three or four there's two traditional ones for America Eastman and Juilliard um, yeah. I, I don't quite know what the difference are I know I studied the Eastman method yeah. um, and then this and then studied the Royal Conservatory uh, which is out of Canada method and then for jazz studies I learned the Berkeley style Gotcha. Uh, and even Berkeley used the Eastman method for their classical studies. Gotcha. I, I know that. Um, I didn't uh, get that far into where the theory comes from or the pedagogy behind it. Yeah, there. Of course, you know, with if we had if we had done a little more research, <laughs> um, we probably <laughs> we would have we would have history. some names. There, That's there are history, people. and if we've learned anything, is history is written wrong. <laughs> Well, music history, I mean, you know, that's that's a spirited subject of debate for music <laughs> history, as, as a lot of our music theory and traditions come from... You can get uh, album credits history. right. Do you expect me to believe in music history? <laughs> Say what? They can't even get album credits right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Ugh, ugh, how political are we going to get today? But, you know, <laughs> I'm you know, just going gonna... to... No, no. Well, what I'm about to say, you know, Western music theory is mostly built on a tradition of of German composers, and, you right. know, like that's where learning it in Italy. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like it's it's in that world that that we that we define a lot of our music, and we use that those definitions to define music like blues and jazz that don't nest well, especially blues that don't necessarily have roots in that tradition, but we've explained it after the fact and and kind of yeah and, and we should stipulate that all of these german composers study music in italy all of them all, i don't know pretty much um and that's why all the music's written in italian oh okay i thought it was just that the popularity of certain operas because there are a lot of italian composers I, I i don't know i was Our, just saying mozart at least mozart haydn all studied in italy Okay. That whole that whole crew, um, Salieri. Uh, if you want to get into music theory, and these guys are are when you talk about music, understanding music theory, I, I mean Mozart and Haydn are are the pinnacle of understanding music theory. Well, for their time, I even for our time, <laughs> they're insanely good at understanding how to use a sound to create an emotion and that sound transfer through time. The sound of that's twinkle, a, that's, that's a hot <laughs> to me, twinkle, a hot twinkle, thing. little star still sounds like a little kid song. Who wrote twinkle, twinkle, little star? Mozart. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know. That's a chicken or the egg thing or not a chicken or the egg thing. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I think that's hard to remove contextuality from. So I, I'm going <laughs> to be on the other side of that. I'm. I'm. I'm not with. Maybe it's just you know. Maybe because that's not closer to my. You know what I like. Yeah. Um. So you studied more from theory from the jazz perspective and rock per, pop perspective. I, I use quotations. Jazz and pop or theory are, are pretty similar. I think what Sting is doing in the '70s is just as complicated as what a lot of the jazz musicians do, as far as chord structures and voicings. Steely Dan's another one. Chord voicing structures, depth of the music is pretty on the par with a lot of jazz. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, 
Yeah, Sting definitely is a, a modal melody writer. So that's something that kind of makes him shout outs to Rick Beato for, you know, doing a little video on that, which was like, oh yeah, of course that's what he's doing. You know, there's not too many guys that um, really exploited certain modes, but you can check out his video for that. But um, uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not saying that like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not trying to be combative. Well, we're trying I, I to just, decide. I just is don't want to say Mozart is a timeless musician and whatever versus other musicians. I don't oh, know. I, I, I Mozart mean, Mozart is more timeless than than a lot of other players. That yeah, I, I, I mean, Mozart is still has number one hits on the radio right now with his music being used as the background tracks. But BTS just cut a song with Mozart in the background. <laughs> Yeah, but you know what I mean? Like, what does that say other than imperialism? That doesn't necessarily, necessarily anything empirically... It doesn't say anything about, about theory. It. The theory just means I can recognize it. Right, right, right. <laughs> the theory is my ability to recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, gosh, I, I don't want to be political, but I guess I do. I need to calm down. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this supposed to be a discussion on theory. So the, the the question is, do we do we really need it though? Is it important? Um, I just realized my camera is really yellow too. Is that important? Uh, um, maybe the theory of color grading is something we can <laughs> cover later. You can do that in post production. No, nah, not. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys, but post production is not part of the facet right now. Right. Um, though I am working on some sweet picking videos, so let's let's take that for example. Uh, my understanding and using of sweet picking is based on my ability to understand theory. Without understanding theory, I don't know how I would be able to do that or how anyone would be able to do that. Um, also, I would say in general with sweet picking, most people don't like listening to it. <laughs> so somewhere in there is, is, is that like where where's the line between creativity and theory and theory becoming creativity um i don't know i mean you know uh, uh, well if if what legitimizes it for you um not you randy but the ro the plural royal <laughs> you, but if what legitimizes it as like as, as working if if um popular music examples legitimize it then there are plenty of times you can find interviews of of great songwriters um that will talk about how their songs go and they have an understanding of some sort now um they might have like different levels by which they can go in depth for it but there are a lot of times when someone's like oh i wanted to i wanted to go from this chord to this chord and you know and they could say oh this chord really sets up the next one um and maybe they don't even know that it's the five chord but they know that this type of chord sound sets up things so, so is that person using music theory? Yes. Do we know? So that's, that, that's and if clearly we, music theory. If and if we agree, that this chord moves to that chord. Yeah. Someone said, so they're here, right? And they go like, like, ooh, I know that this chord's going to lead. I already know the next chord that's going to sound good with this one. You know what I mean? I already know exactly where I want to go. The fact that they knew. I think you can take that a step further and go, I know this chord is going to sound bad over it, and I want something that sounds bad. It's still music theory. That sounds bad. <laughs> it works both ways. Yeah, if you understand the sound of the chords and how they move, that is the first step to understanding music theory. Music theory is just the language applied to that. Right. So they already understand music theory, whether or not they understand the language itself. So in that case, it's not hurting their creativity. And I, I may have mentioned this before, but and maybe it was last week before. I think we week. both agreed thoroughly that you, you learn your music theory. You <laughs> yeah, can't yeah, overlearn just, it. There's no way. Uh, yeah, you can I, overuse I, it, but you can't overlearn it. I think uh, what's the there's a term of like uh, decision crippling where you can only really like have like nine to ten options for something before you get overwhelmed. I don't know what pop science article that was, but I do agree that there's like some kind of like thing where it's like I can only handle so many options before making a decision. Uh, you know what I mean? Like before it's just like too much. Yeah, before and there's I, too many. Right. And I think when some people like stare down you know, stare down into the well of what music theory is and they go like, there's a million choices and, and how do I know even what to use? 
um yeah, yeah, yeah. nice analogy and i was like <laughs> you go into the kitchen and it's not just salt pepper and you know what i mean and cayenne you walk in there and there's cardamom and there's turmeric and <laughs> now suddenly you've got like the, uh, saffron and, and like maybe like and basil and like maybe you got like 70 spices and and um someone who's like actually good at cooking will look at me and just like be laughing right now but like you know, like <laughs> step into the world of like different cuisines like thai or indian and have all those spices in your cabinet and then suddenly like you look at it and some people when they have all those options they they for they don't they don't know how each one's supposed to make you feel or they don't know how to use each one so they feel like they have to use all of them and I think when you have all those options and then, you know, at the end of the day, what you end up making is something that kind of maybe tastes like crap because you didn't, you didn't have enough experience because it takes a long time with cooking those different styles to understand how to make that. And I think the same thing is when someone's like a blues player and they look at all the options that jazz has to offer, they go, well, you know, uh, because there are more options, more means better. And now I need to use this and this and try to using this. And, and suddenly they get crippled by like how many different options there are. There's too much to take in the relationships between these things. And instead of using it, instead of, instead of using the theory through songs and understanding like a jazz song that's supposed to make you feel this certain way and then going for that sound, instead they look at the theoretical possibility without necessarily understanding the aesthetic use of it. And then they just get this big like bowl of harmony crap that they don't know how to use. And it can, and it can get deep in, and when you're looking at these double chords, chords on top of chords, especially when you look at seven chords on top of seven chords, eight note chords, there's only 12 notes and you're going to use eight of them to make the chord. Uh, it can get pretty cloudy at that point. Uh, and then when you get into clusters, which I, I always struggled with the idea that jazz musicians got credited with clusters because I, I, I thought that was a Stravinsky thing, but <laughs> that's that has a Oh well, uh, That's I, just a side note. <laughs> I mean, many jazz players. Um, I think yeah, it's stacking, and what we're talking about is just stacking an interval on top of the same interval, uh, but fourths and fifths typically. Right, but like the history of jazz is like it came from the blues, and then like the more they want, the more it was developed over years. Like artists understood the blues side of it, and then they started incorporating like different sounds like from Stravinsky and Ravel and like all these different and a lot of French composers too and you get certain sounds that are uh they are an amalgam you know they're not a, I wouldn't call it a direct copy but you know like it's just that blending pot of influences that that jazz I don't know jazz has different periods too you know what I mean just like classical music yeah yeah oh uh, yeah uh, every music definitely it's not has. always jazz isn't always this you know what I mean? Like, like oh, <laughs> jazz. You know, it's not that. You know, it's and really jazz isn't always this. Right? Yeah, oh. it's not always just. That was really know. jazzy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's not always "Girl from Ipanema" or something. And it's not always two five one. You know, those other. Let's just, yeah, and that gets a slightly different discussion in theory is uh, the punitive use of genres and which is why, you know, just calling something under that. If you're studying music, you gotta, you gotta go further than that. Cause you do because you're not going to get anywhere. Um, yeah. You gotta be able to hear where I think it, like we had a discussion before we started this video, we had a discussion about DAWs and recording and, and the, I think we both agree that the biggest thing with DAWs isn't how much money you spend on it or what you're working with. It's how fast you can use that program. Yeah. Uh, and lots of people are using, I think Pro Tools is still the top one for most top end professional work, but Logic's right there with it. And there's a bunch of other ones. It's the same with music theory. Um, your ear comes first. You want, you hear something. And when I say your ear, I mean your inner ear inside your head. You hear an idea and then you want to recreate it. Mm -hmm. out loud i think that's would represent most musical things even if i'm backing an artist i hear something in my head that i want behind that artist or i hear something that they want behind it they play it for me sometimes i hear it out loud and then i have to recreate that yep. Music theory allows me to recreate that faster 
yeah. with a lot less effort. Um, though it, it took effort at the front end to learn that, hey, this is a four to one. And, and then I can recreate that sound in any key. Yep. And knowing that is, is pretty helpful for like. Yeah. All kinds of stuff. <laughs> what, if, what if your singer's having a bad night? Yeah. You could. And, you and, and dude, they're like. To transpose something down. Take it down. Exactly. They were singing something. Because live, you got to be able to respond instantaneously. Um, what if somebody starts, like, I, I've done this a hundred times. I, I'm the worst about it for some reason. Um, what if somebody starts off playing the song and they get the intro and they start in the wrong key? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know why I'm the worst at this. I'm, I'm usually uh, one of the, I, I've, I feel like I understand theory at an extremely high level, probably higher than I need to. Um, for some reason, playing the song in the correct key is not always in my wheelhouse. So you mean, you mean like starting off like a guitar intro in a different key? Yeah, a guitar intro. Say, you know, I, I pick, I accidentally have my E flat guitar in my hand and I start um, Sweet Child of Mine. So I'm down a half step. We normally play it in regular tuning. We don't play it in Guns N' Roses tuning. No, oh, okay. Like, like that kind of stuff. It's typically that kind of thing. Or I play with a, two different artists and one plays it in one key and one plays it in the other and I just forget. Well, you'll know when someone else comes in. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's for sure. But I mean, that's like, a, I think that's more of a, a question of like the Leviton effect and perfect pitch versus relative pitch, you know, like, I, I think that's something more in that wheelhouse. I don't think that's, I don't think that's theory's fault oh. <laughs> or explanation. No, 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 no. So I wouldn't. <laughs> I, I, but my understanding of theory allows me to, to get to the new key way faster. Yes. Or the re key I'm supposed to be in. Hopefully I've practiced enough to get to the key I'm supposed to be in. Mm -hmm. But my understanding of theory and relationships allows me to just play things in different keys. Um, I think the art of... Oh, man. And, and I, I don't want to quote anything directly, but I, I'm pretty sure it's a Count Basie quote in a Jamie Abersall book. Um, since I spent most of the time studying that form of jazz before I got to Berkeley, I'm going to say it was them. Uh, play everything in every key. <laughs> yeah. Playing things in every key is a great way to do it. Um, and like I think of guitar players like Joe Pass, who says he can't read music or understand theory. I guarantee you he can play every single melody in every single key. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, this is this. Okay. Okay. So I have a counter argument for this theory thing. Like, a, well, like a, just something to point out. Um, theory is great uh, when you need to connect dots between a lot of different like sounds and you can go, oh, it's this to this. There are many people who learned theory just because they learned songs. And all they did was learn songs. They learned this song, this song, like just over and over and over, they learned a whole bunch of songs. Now, I don't know if that always means that they, like, I think at some point as you learn songs, it's it be, like learning a whole bunch of tunes is, is essentially like you're growing up in a household and people are speaking English all around you. You have no choice other than to learn how to speak it. Even if you don't understand necessarily what a subject and a verb is like you can understand when someone isn't speaking it accurately you know like you there's like an immersion that happens just from doing the thing you even if you can't communicate all of it to everybody um you definitely understand what, what chords work together just because you spent the time living there now i think a lot of people that study music don't have the tolerance that some of the great artists that you know that have studied music had for just picking up and absorbing full songs like connecting dots like oh this one thing sounded like this one thing eventually if you learn enough songs a lot of these things in music theory you will understand even if you don't have the name that everyone else has for it um, yeah how much of that for the great artists is just their sheer like determination to learn it I mean, yeah. when I hear stories of these great artists and stuff and you read backgrounds, and everybody's like, Coltrane 
Like, I mean, occasionally he came to school. He always had his saxophone in his hand. <laughs> you know, he, he just, he never didn't play a saxophone. Yeah. And he's like, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, you know, a dude like that played everything. Of and played Mozart, everything. he was playing, I think his dad, Mozart had, Mozart's dad had him on stage with his sister, like five years old, playing parties for their friends. Right. And people. And he made him play practice all day, every day. Now, obviously, a different time period. If you did that today, you would probably be arrested, but <laughs> or worse. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, go, <laughs> I don't know how <laughs> severe it was. This is the 1700s, so you know. I, I think that sheer determination, though, and will, or being forced to, it doesn't matter which way you come about it, but that massive amount of hours doing it mm -hmm. and working at it. Yeah. I mean, you'll connect the dots, but for those, for those of you that, that, you know, like don't want to beat your head against the wall song by song when you're first starting out, <laughs> you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes having like a common language to, to get, <laughs> to get through it will, will definitely help. It's well, like, uh, yeah. What's the most basic music theory thing we could teach everybody right now? Right now? Right this second. Like off the top of your head. Simple the most, music theory thing. The most simple music theory thing I can give you is at least the first. It's a pretty, I'm stealing it from the sound of music. But um, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Um, if you can take a, Yeah, if you have... If you have a one, two, or do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. So that, that, cha change that song from the sound of music to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Go ahead and think about that song and that sound in numbers um, and, and listen for the numbers in songs. Now it's really hard. So, so how you can apply that faster is is if you know that song you'll know where it starts and where it ends is one so if you go one two three four five one every song that you listen to most songs that are popular that you know every song has that one note that comes back to one and feels like it resolves so if you want to get better at music theory the very easiest first thing you can do is listen to a song and see if you can hum whatever you feel is the resolving one that note if you can at least find that like if i played a couple of chords here uh, and you went mm, 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 okay yeah that note kind of felt like mm, that was the one that felt like one to me after hearing some of those chords Okay, great. All you got to do is hum it, kind of try to find that note that feels like you're really at home. And of course, you might go. You might have to kind of move around a little bit. But if you listen, most songs have that feeling of wherever home is. Some songs are a little bit harder to find, but search for one. Yeah, that's my theory. That's my first thing you can do. Easiest thing to show. <laughs> You need help discerning one for sure, but at least search for that one resolving feeling. Maybe at the end of a song, you know, you goes boom like that, and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's the note that feels like home. Yeah, and and any time that a song doesn't have that, they're doing it on purpose. Yeah, it, 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 it's to make you feel uncomfortable. So anytime a song ends and you feel uncomfortable, it's probably not the one. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, you're not going to find this in every song, for sure. I, I, I mean, like, fade-outs, you won't find it on fade-outs, obviously. But even on fade-outs, I try to make sure my fade-outs end on the one chord, too. Oh, even though it's subtle. Because <laughs> <laughs> it sounds more comfortable. if the. Because I know it's fading out, but if the last thing you hear on the fade-out is a one, it does feel more comfortable. And not just one, but, like, beat one as well. Oh, okay. It does feel more comfortable. Um, and so these things, so that's where theory gets confusing for me. <laughs> I, no, I just like, I felt myself get lost there for a second <laughs> because we <laughs> use numbers for scales and we use numbers for rhythms. And what do we do? How do we learn all this stuff? 
So I, I would take lessons at Ovation Music Studios. In <laughs> <laughs> we'll be like, well, we'll like be, I mean, I'll be uh, Aaron and I'll, and, and and everybody who's here with us will be more than happy to teach you this stuff. Um, but I actually, Do Re Mi Fa Sol La Ti Do was the second thing that came to my head when I thought about it. It was Sound the first the thing that came to my head initially, but it, I didn't think it was the easiest, so I thought of something else. Does that make sense? So yeah. it was the first thing I thought of, but I don't think it's the easiest thing to learn. The number one theory thing that everybody has to learn, no matter what instrument you play, and a barring an experimental genre, count to four evenly. Keeping a steady one, two, three, four, one, two, three, for now uh the stipulation with that is this is for western music and by the definition of western anything west of turkey settled by those countries in americas does not include african culture or anything asian middle east um, or russian i don't think still helps either way yeah, I, I think it's it's moved that direction um, for sure. Like the biggest band in the world right now is BTS out of what are they Korea out of Korea? Oh my God, don't that's gonna be terrible if I'm wrong. All the everybody's gonna know I'm wrong. <laughs> I think it's Korean. I think they're a Korean group. They just released their first sure English song. Uh, it got a hundred and twenty four million hits in the first day. <laughs> so in the, at that rate, it'll be the most watched song on YouTube in five days. No, in 10 days. Something crazy. It's ridiculous. And they're out of Korea, but they're singing in 4-4. Four, four. The, the whole point was they're singing in 4. When you count the song, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. And it's the biggest song in the entire world. Well, I mean, at this point, you know, homogenous pop music, it's it's all around the globe. <laughs> it's nothing, you know what I mean? Um, I've only and heard a couple songs, but I mean, it's, you know... Yeah, and it's hard to play anything out of time, too, because we're going to definitely get copy striked because out-of-time stuff is really recognizable. Because oh. it's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and even the stuff that's... And so I, I would go there for the simplest stuff. Be able to count the four consistently, yeah. and you can pretty much turn on the radio in any genre. I would even say I even I even do this with I even do this with my students with Spotify playlist. I pick I, ha, I pick random Spotify playlist and it works more than 90 percent of the time, even in avant garde metal playlist where you think, oh, my God, these guys use crazy time signatures. They, they really don't. You can still count. They they can't they play in four and occasionally use really crazy time signatures in odd places. Right. We're not. We're trying to get beginning though. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, the beginning four, four count to four, and be able to do it consistently yeah. for a you long period of time. You know what's funny? I I think and maybe this was um, <laughs> another YouTube vlogger that I'm thinking of who mentioned this, but um, okay. So shout outs to whoever I'm thinking of who said this, but you know, like when you counted on the playground as a kid, hide and seek. And you counted down or counted to ten. How did you count it when you weren't cheating? <laughs> you know, you wouldn't go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's something like most of the time when you're taught to count, there's like an internal internal pulse there that's actually very, very, very close to a click. Even asking a child to count like to, to four, like like in that kind of thing, they very rarely speed up or slow down their tempo by a noticeable margin. So, you know, counting is something that um, you do have to work on learning how to sync it up with a song. But if you're ever like, I have a hard, you know, I'm, I, I, I can't find the, you know, I'm not good at music or rhythm. It's like you, you, can, you can keep it steady tempo like you, if even if you just counted to ten, like in hide and seek when you were a kid, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Like you know, like most of the time, most people don't go one, 
two, three, four. You don't do the, the Chatner thing, you know, nobody, does that. <laughs> so, but, you know, so, so, so there, there is something a little, there's something very internal about keeping a steady pace. Uh, there's, there's flex to that, but yeah. I think most people, when they hear a song is when they don't know how to apply that counting to it. So if you learn how to do that, is that going to delete your creativity? <laughs> delete. Delete's no. kind of a strong word. No. Uh, but I, I think the fear is that people learn theory and then they don't sound musical. Yeah. And and really, I, I think that's just the overuse of the music theory. Well, yeah, it's like... It's like it, for learn. the sake of music theory. Well, so, it's like someone learned the word, they learned the word loquacious today. So they go like, oh, I was feeling rather loquacious. I, I found myself in the coffee shop for hours longer than I intended to be. And you're like, oh, you learned the word loquacious. And now all I can hear is that you learned a new word. <laughs> and you're really flexing it. So sometimes you get the effect of like, I learned it. I'm just using it, but you can, the way you deliver it, just like with an, a, a bigger harmony, right? Is that you could say something like, it was like, even if you're saying it not in jest, you can use the word loquacious and your delivery of it doesn't feel so out of place. And, and it's, I, and we keep using word analogies to, to sounds, but it's definitely, you, you learn a new jazz chord and you're like, or a new chord, I say jazz chord, you learn a new chord that has like an extended harmony thing that you don't find in many other genres. And so you're like, I feel like I've got to use it. And sometimes you use it and it's so obvious you're just using it rather than trying to use it in a way that has the intended effect that, that sometimes it's, it's hard. And that's where music theory things can be difficult for people is that they're like, I want to use this, but I don't know how to use this. I want, you know, and I, and, and there is a trial and error process. You know, you, you kind of have to use it. Uh, I don't I won't say wrong. You have to use it inappropriately to understand that that's inappropriate. You, you can't with music. You have to. You have to? Oh. With music theory, I, I feel like you do. You, you've got to try what the different chords sound like next to each other. And sometimes you'll find out it's not inappropriate. It's just not used like that typically okay. I, I think of nirvana chord progressions a, a lot of those will it's like they almost have like key changes inside of them and the, but they're just five chords without the extensions on them and so you're like well how can you make the, these key changes sounds without having the extra notes to do that and part of it is wow that note sounds wrong so let's just use it it's cool <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't. That's all, that's I just trailed off. You just. You just said a lot of things to unpack. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, which Nirvana song is he talking about? And he's like, five chords, but wait, now wrong notes. I'm like, I'm like, I'm, like, I'm not sure what you consider a wrong note or what you're calling a five chord or what Nirvana song this is. So I was like, wait. And, and, and that's saying it's not there. I'm just like, I don't know what's <laughs> that becomes the issue with that. And that becomes one of the issue people have with theory. Now we sort of baseline of theory of baseline of music is that it's communication. Yep. So our, your word analogies are amazing. <laughs> Thanks. And then the understanding of the music language is theory. Um, sometimes we mess it up. <laughs> Don't, don't we? I, I think I, I can think of the first time it's like, ooh, I learned, you know. This like, guy's oh, I, re really good at that. <laughs> this guy, this guy has had some some moments. <laughs> You're like, ooh, I like this chord. Oh, this is. But sometimes, sometimes, like some people go like, this is a jazz chord. This chord yeah, makes chord. this makes me smart. You know what I mean? Like the thing, like a bigger harmony thing is like. Like I'm doing something a lot of people don't know how to use. And that's not how it was ever used. You know what I mean? But I think people that, that struggle with theory or, or struggle with jazz even, they think that because you're using it, you know what I mean? That it's like that, that now, you know, you're, the thing that you're saying is egotistical and that's not how you should use it. <laughs> it might, I, mean, I mean, I guess you can use it, sure. But if you're like, I am smart because... 
this sounds like I have depth, you know what I mean? Because I had a really dramatic set of changes. I could use more of your piano, honestly. I could use more of your piano. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't, well, sorry. <laughs> that so like, again. Huh? I'll do, I'll do another one just for, for that in-depth one. <laughs> like oh i'm smart you shouldn't do that because i'm smart <laughs> you should do it you should do it because this feeling like sounds like it because i to have an effect in the context and i think um it's it's an easy pitfall to do because you know when you study music you work really hard for a long time to make a lot of different sounds so why do you do it maybe it is egotistical i don't know so maybe this is getting too big but but when you go yeah. to, <laughs> it's, when you it's, go for a certain sound it should be like it should it should give you a feeling that like like it, it should feel like something to you that doesn't just feel self-serving or like you should never feel obligated to make a big sound when you're learning all these new sounds you shouldn't feel obligated to use them because they're harder to learn you should go to you know what i mean like the, just because it's a you, less apply them. you know like like make sure it means something to you before you use it find art that uses it that you really truly love maybe and, and let that be what guides you into those sounds not because the sounds themselves are empirically better i, know? I like that that and that's where i would start you know, where that's actually where I start all my students off with music theory is by teaching them the music theory of the songs that they like. Um, I'm with you 100. And and then I do try to do the. I'm a huge Frank Zappa fan. It's I think most people know this, and they're probably learning online that I'm a huge Frank Zappa fan. I also force all my students to learn the things they absolutely hate the most. And maybe it's because of the way my life has been and maybe because I studied Frank Zappa, but I've definitely learned more from the stuff that I hate than the stuff that I like. I don't know why. <laughs> maybe it's because it takes more effort and I have to push through it harder. Um, but learning those things and learning that theory behind that stuff, I know to stay away from it. I know that, oh, man, I want to make a song that sounds happy but I don't want to sound like Pharrell. I know that initially I need to stay from R&B style Marvin Gaye type drum beats with one, six, four, five chords. I need to find a different approach to make something sound happy. Right. Which happy doesn't use one, six, four, five for the record. Oh, but is it not? Is it? A, oh, it's a two. Right. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't remember now. I think I'm terrible. My memory's horrible. Memory's another thing you should work on. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, right? It's got the, um, it's got kind of got that. Uh, might seem crazy, and I'm going to say. Uh, it's kind of got like a, it's kind of got like an F. It's got the blues like, thing in the verse. It's got, like, it's got a blues thing in the verse, and then it goes to, Yeah, so it's, it's got like the flat six major seven chord to the five minor seven chord, and then five minor five, the five minor seven chord back to the one major. So it's kind of got like a you know it's got a flat six five, but really really technically like like it's it's a I mean it's an interesting little change right. So like the flat six major seven chord to the five minor seven chord, five minor seven chord again to the one major, and so. It's an interesting little bit. So like D flat major seven to C minor seven, C minor seven to F major. Sorry, he got stuck on a specific song. Actually, you know what's funny is I can't remember if he does it in the key of F or if it's not. Man, I, I... Maybe I put that in a different key. Guys, I am sorry I made that assumption. I, I assumed it was a one six four. I'm not gonna lie. I didn't mean to call out. I was just like I heard the song the other day and I was like, oh, I I don't know. Even pop, pop music songs? if I'm listening to pop music now, I'm listening for production, not theory, because the theory behind it's usually pretty simple. That one's actually surprisingly complicated. Well, I would trust your ear on production way more than I would trust my ear. <laughs> so 
you hear things in a in a track sometimes production wise where i'm like i'm like what the heck did randy just talk about <laughs> Like, <laughs> well, the the music theory I studied in college was music production, and so, uh, like trying to time the reverb trail of a snare drum, and for the, those of you who don't know what reverb is or a snare drum, I'm so sorry. <laughs> or what you mean by trail? Or what I mean by trail? Walking path in the woods, typically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, but at no point has any of this theory hurt our, I don't think it's hurt our creativity in this, no. even it's made our discussion way more creative too. <laughs> when you think about it that way, I know, I know when I was a blues guitarist and I first learned jazz chords, I was like, I was decision crippled and, and you know, like I, I was, I, I was, the where, where was, what's that? See, I feel like understanding theory just makes blues boring for me because there are no decisions to make anymore. There's no way to be loose. I don't think that's true. Blues has got a lot to say. I think I think if you're stuck in one type of blues, maybe, but... Yeah, yeah, like if you're going to... I'm just going to play traditional blues. I want to sound like 1950s electric blues. Buddy yeah, Guy, right. Howlin' Wolf, and that's it. That's all I want to do. Then the, it's pretty limiting... There's definitely, yeah, I mean, there's, but, you know, that's, you know, that's not, that's not the genre blues's fault. You know what I mean? No, 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 not at all. Not at all. Like, I just don't, I, you know, I've heard, I've, I've heard people go like, I've heard people like actually say stuff like, well, I think blues is the, is the simplest, you know, and it's like, it's the, and, and, you know, what they're getting is like one type of a thing. And it's unfortunate because, because blues is so much, you know what I mean. And it's, well, it's it's a big old genre, and I hate stereotyping genres. Yeah, yeah. Let's not stereotype the genre. Let's stereotype the theory behind it and the players. Yeah. I, and I think blues is a genre where people do get uh, stereotyped as bad players if they know a lot of theory. Well, that's yeah, yeah. I guess I guess there there is a, you know, there is an order to, you know. Like, but you know, there's buddy a guy seems to be pretty good at his chord changes. What's that? Buddy guy seems to be pretty good at understanding chord changes and melodies. Yeah, I, I just think that's you know, that's that's the haters. Don't listen to the haters, <laughs> don't listen to the haters. <laughs> but I feel like the two genre when you talk about music theory crippling creativity, the, the two genres that come to my mind are blues and alternative rock alternative rock uh, rock music in general um, I don't really know what the genre would be called it's called rock but it's not like heavy mm, okay like like Jack White I feel like if everybody found out Jack White knows all his scales they'd be really upset oh uh... like you don't you can't understand theory to play the, and play that music oh yeah, but you know, we went back to like, what is theory, right? Other than knowing. What is theory? What, no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, can you see? We my... always end up as soon as you can count to four, you understand theory, so you might as well learn the rest of it. Because yeah, that, to like... me, to me, that is the simplest form of theory. And it, uh, when I think about it over and over again, that being able to count is the simplest form of theory, and it is the foundation for how everything's built. Yeah, and just because you know, like you know, terms of Western theory and how to describe things that are complicated, like by the definition of this has this many notes or this has this complicated a ratio between the frequencies, however, however you want to state it, just because you have learned the names of those things, it doesn't mean you know how to use them creatively in a way that satisfies you and your own artistic expression. You know, you gotta, you know, just because you have them there doesn't mean you know, you know, make make sure that it means something. Because at the end of the day, this let's not forget it's art, right? Right? It should be. It's still even even if you're doing it to sell a cheeseburger or whatever, it's still art, and it's still in, it has an intention and a feeling and an emotion you're trying to make out of it. So like, don't you know, like, like make sure make sure your intention's there. You know, don't use it to hurt anybody. <laughs> Like, like I, I mean, you know, don't be Wagner in your intentions. <laughs> well, Wagner wasn't trying to hurt people. 
<laughs> that was uh, and, and Stravinsky was the one that actually hurt people. Well, he played music that caused people to hurt people. Anyway. Anyway, I, I said I didn't want to get political, but I'm just I just I'm just saying it so gets if you if you really if you, if you really want to get into early twentieth century ballet music, you know Stravinsky and the Rite of Spring. I mean that is the the peak of music and its destruction. I think the next time something that destructive in music happened was the Stones hiring the Hell's Angels as bodyguards. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot about that one. <laughs> so you know. Uh, so listen to some music. Some uh, do we have a, a, a list of musicians that we know understand music theory really, really well that people can listen to? Um, I know for a fact the guys from Imagine Dragons are really good at music theory. They're okay. excellent, excellent, excellent. I was in school at the same time. A, a few of them were, and and they were all really, really good at, at music theory. At pretty much everything music. Com they were good at software, math music they're just lights out good okay um, i don't know anybody that i know for sure like i would imagine john mayer's pretty good in music theory um just because of his history and going to berkeley and getting in in the process during that time period yeah i mean i guess yeah but like what are we again what are we I, i'm sorry I'm back, I'm back to it what are we saying music theory is you know they're creating art with very, you know, with chords and melodies that have intention and move, a certain, you know, like. That's so, what, do they understand it musically? Yeah, they understand. I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you know they don't? <laughs> you, know what I mean? they, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how, how can you prove they know it? How can you disprove that they know it at that point? You know, it's, I think. I can't, luckily, I, I worked with one of the guys from Imagine Dragons, and, and he was really good. <laughs> it was just a fortunate opportunity I had that uh, at the at, and at the time he was not in Imagine Dragons and, and that wasn't a thing but right I think yeah. there are, like if, if we're looking for like if you're looking for people that have like that speak the language of western music theory that you know you and I Randy and Aaron both know pretty pretty darn well at this point if you're looking for like an artist that can speak that then what you're saying is is that like that, that he can speak that too right yeah yeah right right he understands his theory it hasn't killed his creativity no no uh you know i think you know what one of the more advanced i say advanced but one of the more like complicated types of harmonic use uh um musicians out there right now um jacob collier like is able to talk very at length about these different things there's some great interviews of someone who knows music theory really well is making a lot of music and it certainly only makes him more creative. Obviously, I love Steely Dan and their interviews with Donald Fagan where you can hear him talking about even like the chord progression to peg and he's going like, he's going, he's going, he's going through playing some of those chords on peg and he's going like, oh, I know I wanted it to be like, I know I wanted it to be a G chord, but we didn't want that kind of seventh thing for like that. He's like, we didn't want that kind of bluesy sound. We wanted something that, that didn't have that dominant kind of seven sound. So we wanted something that kind of felt a little open, was a little ambiguous on major and minor. Um, and then fit That's into six, more blues six, context. Six plus four? Yeah, yeah. This is um, like, it goes from like a C major seven chord, which it's like a little four, four, one idea on G. So that's like a C major seven chord. And then it goes into a stacking of G's in the bass, right? And then you have scale degrees two, five, and then one on top. So it's it's really just a sus two chord, but stack here, you know, in quartals. So it's like a fourth and a fourth apart between two and five, and then five back to one. But like, and he talks about that in the interview at length. And and he's someone that that happens to know it as well. But I think there, there's there's plenty that that know that too. You know? Creativity whatsoever. Not not at all. You know, like not at all. And I think Donald Fagan, I would say it expanded his, it seems like it's expanded his creativity quite a bit. Right, right. And you know, like, I, I think you might have somebody that you look up an interview and they go like, oh, I like this chord and I like going to, oh, I like that chord. I like going to this and I like going to this. Yeah. You know, like, I like these chords. I, I just know that I like them. 
and that's it. To that, and you know what's funny is we have a there's a student at at who, who takes lessons at a at Ovation, and who I, I teach keyboard the, lessons with. The same way he likes he's like I know I like these chords. What is it? Exactly, and he was kind of like I want to know music theory so I can explain these things. And 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 he was and he, and he was and but he, see he new sounds that he liked he had already learned very advanced kind of bigger i, I say advanced play. but chords that have many notes in them really and, well. and, he, and he plays really well and he's got a great sound and he was and he was like well i don't he's like you know he was like well i don't want to be doing it all wrong you know i've learned all these things and i was kind of like i was like what don't throw any of that away you know what i mean you, you've been <laughs> making choices that 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 are any 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 plays at church and, you know, it's like you're making all of these choices that, that fit and communicate something really well just because you don't know the names of them. And see, and then he was like, well, he's like, I want to be able to, because he would say, he would say, I want to be able to be on the bandstand. And when they say, hey, we're going to the two chord, I want to be able to just go there without just having to, you know, with, I, I want to know how to do that without having to like jump around and find exactly what they're talking about. I want them to, because I want to be able to just look at a chart and go, oh, that's what this chord means. And for him, music theory was not what chords feel good together, but he wanted to, to just be able to read a chart so he could communicate on the bandstand more comfortably. And for great artists and great composers, a lot of them have like, you know, they've got the drive to just start at nothing and just make, make an entire industry out of themselves and what they want. And for them, many of them, they don't have to be able to communicate what they do through anything other than playing it. But there are many more musicians um, that are part of the limelight and that are not that that have to communicate very regularly with lots of other people. And for all of us, myself included, you know, um, you have to it, understand and theory and it really helps. You have to. There's I, I couldn't imagine not understanding theory and doing an artist gig or a recording session with tons of songs on it. Absolutely. Because I mean, the producer, producers, especially now, um, you know, I haven't been doing this in forever or anything, but the last 10 years, the amount of pre-production time for, hey, here's the charts and the acoustic demos for the songs has turned into, okay, we'll see you on Monday. <laughs> you know, no, no advance notice on what to do. I, and I, and maybe that's just a, from taking a step up on the notch. I know lots of higher end sessions kind of operate that like that anyways, but they usually have budgets to have pretty hefty pre-production. And so you'll have a recording that has the part already ready. Yeah. You know, so you're just picking out a part. Whereas a lot of times, especially here in Nashville, we're improvising. So not only do we have to understand how to read the chart, but we have to improvise a performance based on said chart because the chart's not even clear enough to tell us what to play. Yeah, yeah. It just tells us about what key it should be in <laughs> yeah. and genre. To be able to communicate through th mediums other than the sound itself. Yeah, so the biggest thing for I, I think of is if you're going to learn music theory, the biggest thing is, is communication. It's going to allow you to communicate faster. Sometimes you'll slip up. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying that for myself. Sometimes I'm going to slip up. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> especially when it comes some, to Sometimes music you'll say paschetti instead of spaghetti, you know? Sometimes it's <laughs> I might get in trouble if I said that. <laughs> um. But yeah, so now the understanding that music theory allows me to do jobs that I wouldn't be able to do. And like you said, if you want to be, if you ha or you're an artist with a vision who wants to just do this thing and you can hear it in your head, you just need to get that out. If theory helps you get it out faster, that's fine. If theory hinders you from that, maybe there's something to it. I don't really believe that. Theory is not going to alter what you hear in your head. Yeah, yeah don't, don't, don't believe the hype. <laughs> yeah, know. Guthrie Govan has a good video on this. He's like, uh, you know, blues guitar players come in, they want to learn theory, and they know this lick. And, and of course, he used from our first video. You can go back and check that out. He uses this lick. And he's like, well, you know, if you're on the four chord, you can do this really cool thing where you play this note. But don't do it 
don't take away to add that. You don't take that away. You just add to it. See, you don't let let the theory take away what you already have. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, eventually, theory just kind of opens new doors, you know, it, to. <laughs> I'm like about to shove an analogy that doesn't belong in there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ignore what I was about to say. Was gonna say. <laughs> Where are we going with this? I was going to say, music theory opens um, pantry the, doors. To the school. door to the end of the video. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. So uh, so the the point of this video, guys, and, and this is actually a fairly long one. This is awesome. I hope you're all still with us. Uh, is we're going to do some basic music theory lessons for you at some point. Yeah, we'll be working on that. You can check out some of the sweet picking videos. We're working on more parts of that. Uh, you can also check out Aaron's channel, Aaron King Guitar. Is it Aaron King Guitar on YouTube? Uh, I'll put a it's link a, in the comments. It's Aaron King Music Lessons. Aaron King Music Lessons in the comments. Uh, I'll, I'll tag that in the comments below. Aaron's doing some more in-depth, uh, advanced technical studies, um, which are which are super cool. Uh, and we'll put, post a link over on his side. Kick back your hair kick back over here <laughs> Pischetti, Pischetti. and leave your can you count the um uh fundamental english misuse errors in the comments please <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys for hanging out with us again i'm randy over at ovation music and studios here with mr aaron keen at me. aaron keen guitar aaron keen music lessons on youtube you got it.